All right, so section 9.4 is going to conclude our discussion of probabilities um, and um, odds and things like that um, for chapter 9. And what we're going to be taking a look at in this section specifically are things called permutations and combinations. Um, and what permutations and combinations, generally speaking, are is they're ways of counting how many ways we can do something. Um, so when we take a look at rolling that die, it had six sides, so there are six ways that it can be counted. But we can easily see that. It became more difficult when we had two die, right? You had to count how many different ways something could happen, and there was a different structure for counting the outcomes that could occur. So we're going to take a look um, at uh, these specific ones called combinations and permutations, and we need a little bit of notation in order to do that. Um, we need a notation called a factorial. So it looks like an exclamation point. Um, some of your calculators probably even have an exclamation point in it um, to do factorials. Um, and what it really means is that it's a multiplication statement. So if you have n factorial, it means you take n and you multiply it by one less than n, and another one less than that, and another one less than that, and you keep multiplying until you get down to three, two, one. And it stops when you get to one. So if it said five factorial, it would mean you're going to do five times four times three times two times one. If it says 100 factorial, that's not helpful. You don't like that. You're going to do 100 times 99 times 98 times 97 times 96 all the way down to times one. Okay, but that's what it would mean. Definition, right? Zero factorial. Zero factorial is one. Okay, it doesn't follow the same definition as n factorial, where n is greater than one. So this is true up here when n is greater than or equal to one. Okay, and it's a whole number as well. So uh, if you want to say, you could actually describe it this way instead. You could say n is a natural number. I don't know if you all remember that notation. That e with the little thing means it's, it is. It's an element of that. Okay. Natural numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five. So we're not going to do like 4.2 factorial. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, no fractions, no decimals. Um, so if we're looking at an example, 4 factorial, by definition, it means 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And I don't need to see any of it multiplied out. You're going to write it down, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and you're going to grab your calculator, and you're going to let your calculator multiply. And you're going to tell me, what is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1? I know you might be able to do that one in your head just fine, but 24 is right. Yeah. A lot of our larger ones, you're going to want a calculator for it. So there was an earlier, it's like way back in Chapter 2, which I know is not part of the curriculum for this class. Um, but it's really important to what we're about to do. Um, and so we need to sort of encounter it one more time. Um, and it's called the Fundamental Principle of Counting. It says that if we have, we'll use, for example, two different events, event M and event N. So if event M can occur in little m ways, and event N can occur in little n ways, then the number of ways that those two things followed by one another can occur is M times N. And if you think back to our example where we're rolling the die, it actually comes into play. So you know that when you roll one die, you have six options, right? And when you roll another die, there's six options. And when you roll both of them at one time, there's six times six, which is 36 different things that can show up. Now, some of them repeat each other. They're not all unique. But there are 36 different outcomes. And that's what the table was that we saw on page like 519. It was a table of all those outcomes. You did some counting of some things um, as you looked at those. That's what was occurring. That's the fundamental principle of counting. Six times six, and multiply them together, 36 outcomes. So let's look at an example of one where we actually see um, this coming into play. Pizza Planet, which is from Toy Story, offers three kinds of salads, 15 kinds of pizza, and four desserts. There are three events. You're choosing a salad, you're choosing a pizza, and you're choosing a dessert. Those are your events. Okay? And I want to know how many different meals you could create with those conditions. So in a very real sense, you have three events. One event has three ways of doing it, one event has 15 ways, and one event has four ways. And the fundamental principle of counting says I simply multiply those outcomes together. So 3 times 15 times 4, and what do you get? 
180 different meals. <coughs> so we see fundamental principle of counting pop up. Okay, There's two other things that can pop up, and there's really three. Um, one of them is broken into two parts. So as you look at these problems, right now I'm just introducing them to you and I'm showing you an example of one. Eventually when you get to their homework, they're not going to say, use the fundamental principle of counting to figure out how many different meal combinations Pizza Planet has. Mm -hmm. They're going to give you the Pizza Planet example just like I did, but they're going to assume that you can figure out which of the different strategies has to be used. Make sense? Okay, so let's take a look at some of the others that are happening. Um, another option, so option number one is fundamental principle counting. Option number two is permutation of like objects. So if n elements choose R1 of which are alike, R2 of which are alike, alike objects are indistinguishable, <coughs> then the number of ways that we can have this happen is n factorial divided by R sub 1 factorial R sub 2 factorial all the way up to R sub n factorials. And the best way to describe what this is doing is really with the example that follows so that we can actually talk about concrete objects, okay? So hold tight to the description. Let's look at an example so you can see what's, what pieces are playing in where. Starburst. All right, so in a starburst, you have lots of different colors. But each package doesn't have the same number of yellows as it does the yellow number of pinks. Um, and it doesn't necessarily even from package to package, right? So this is a really good example of any, any type of, I don't know, food's a really good one for this one, candies, where you have colors of things. So you think of Starburst, you think of Skittles, you can think of M&Ms. Um, you can also think of things where colors simply don't matter. You know, you've got um, the drawer of socks and you're doing things with organizing your socks, right? So all the brown socks look like a brown sock, like they wouldn't in my drawer because that's not the way my socks work. We've talked about socks before in here, right? But if you were looking at my husband's drawer, all the brown socks are going to look exactly alike, okay? So it's things that are indistinguishable from one another. Starburst is a great example. If I have a pink Starburst in my left hand and a pink Starburst in my right hand and I eat them, it doesn't matter which order I eat them in, they taste exactly the same. They're indistinguishable. But what we're wanting to calculate is we're wanting to calculate, for example, in this particular um, argument, how many different ways we could eat the Starburst. Right, so like eating pink and then orange is different than eating orange and then pink. And then we've got all the colors that follow down the line afterwards. By the way, pink is the best, just throwing that out there. So, <laughs> how many Starbursts are there in this scenario that's given here? That's the first thing we need to know. Can you count them up? There are 14 <coughs> Starburst. Starbust, how about Starburst <laughs> total? That's n. So my equation over here, where it has the n factorial on top, is the total number of objects that I have, completely and totally. So it's 14. And the denominator is each of the indistinguishably different things, right? the things that can be distinguished. So in this case, it's the pink, the red, the orange, and the yellow. I have four different numbers that are going to go in the denominator. They may not all be different from one another, but I'm going to have four of them with an exclamation point after each one, okay? So we'll start with the first one. It says there are four reds. That's four factorial. There are five pink. It's five factorial. Three yellow, three factorial. And two orange, two factorial. Now there's really nothing special about the order in which I put them. I just went straight from the question, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, and the reason it doesn't matter is because I'm gonna multiply them all together in the end anyway, all right? We need to calculate this. Now, this one's not too big. If you wanted to figure out what is 14 factorial and you wanted to write it out and you wanted to figure out all these, you could do it. It wouldn't be bad uh, because it's not a terribly large number. But we're going to get to an example next class period where we have much larger numbers, like 50 factorial. I mean, your calculator will not support you doing 50 factorial. It will freak out. It will turn things into scientific notation is what it'll actually do. And then you lose accuracy because you've got a decimal showing up in the middle of something that's not a decimal value and you've got an e to the something at the end because it's turning into the times 10 to the stuff. We don't want to do that. What we know about this is this is supposed to be the number of ways something happens. So whatever answer we get out of this, it better be a whole number. Does that make sense? 
Well, the only way it's going to be a whole number is if everything on the bottom cancels with something on top, right? I need to get a denominator that, that's one in order to get a whole number. So check this out. We're going to write a few of these out, 14 times 13 times 12. And I'm going to write it out until I get to 5, because 5 is the biggest value on bottom. That's what I'm going to stop. And when I stop with 5 factorial, I have to write the factorial, because I'm not writing out 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So I need to represent that I've got 5 factorial still there, because the 4, 3, 2, 1 I didn't write out. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write every one of them out except for the 5 factorial that still exists on top. So I still have a 5 factorial on bottom, right, this one. But now I have a 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 for the 4 factorial. I have a 3 times 2 times 1 for the 3 factorial. And I have a 2 times 1 for the 2 factorial. So the only ways that I can cancel and simplify with factorials is if they match exactly. So this is 5 factorial, this is 5 factorial. I can cancel them completely. I can't do it over here and say, hey, look, 14 divides by 2. So I'm going to divide 14 by 2 and rewrite the top as 7 factorial. That is not true. So you can only cancel them if they're completely identical, and these are at this point. 5 factorials have canceled from the top and the bottom. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to combine pieces, you're going to cancel pieces, whatever it takes to cancel things from the numerator. So I tend to like to combine pieces. For example, 4 times 3 is 12, so I can cancel the 12 out. Uh, 3 times 2 is 6, so I can cancel the 6 out. So, so that was nice, right? There's a couple places where they combine nicely. Um, but I'm left with still a couple of 2s on bottom, and I need to cancel them out on top somewhere. So maybe you say 2 times 2 is 4. 8 divided by 4 is 2. Maybe you cancel a 2 out of the 10 and a 2 out of the 14. It doesn't matter, but they're going to simplify. The thing that you need to be really, really careful about here is that you're writing neatly enough that you can find all the things that are not canceled. Because it's really easy to lose one of those pieces, especially if your handwriting is sort of on the spectrum where it's a little messier than a little neater. Because you tend to lose things when it's messier. I do too when I've got my handwriting and it's not the neat, as neat as it normally is. So the 14 a 13, an 11, a 10, a 9, a 2, and a 7. The 7 would be easy to miss on this one because of the way I've canceled mine. And those are the numbers that I would need to multiply together. So I'd grab a calculator and I'd multiply 14 times 13 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 2 times 7. And if you chose to cancel things in a little bit different fashion, pair things together differently, whatever, it's not going to make any difference. It's still going to all clean up in the exact same way. And you're going to end up with 2,522,520 different ways of eating that container of Starburst. Isn't that crazy? It's 14 little pieces of candy and it just explodes because of the way the factorials are working. So these are like objects, right? Pink, a pink starburst looks just like any other pink starburst. Sometimes we don't have objects that are alike. We have objects where every single object is different. Um, so some examples of that are often people, right? But if I looked at this perspective of this one right here where they're indistinguishable, do you remember that example where we had sent people to Hawaii, men and women? If I only considered their gender, the men or the women, they'd be indistinguishable by that category, right? So just because it's people doesn't necessarily mean they're distinguishable. It depends on how you're comparing them. Are you really comparing person to person or are you somehow grouping them within a category? The same thing would happen if I grouped things in like freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Well, now I've put them in a category. Every freshman is just like any other freshman if that's all I care about on that attribute. So the next one is actually looking at things where we have permutations of unlike objects, things that truly are different. In red on the screen and in big, bold, massive words on your paper, it says order matters. The reason that's written in is because the next example I'm going to show you, order doesn't matter. So in a permutation of unlike objects, you have n elements, 
and you choose R of them. <coughs> so in our class today, if we were talking about this class, two, four, six, eight, there's eight of us. We would be the eight factorial, and if we wanted to choose one person at random or two people at random, that would be the R. How many am I choosing to do whatever? So you'll notice you see n factorial on top. You see the subtraction of n minus the number you choose on bottom. And they both have factorials on them. So here is an example of where the individual pieces are distinctly different. 30 contestants put their name in a hat for a raffle. First place wins $100. Second place wins $50. And third place wins $25. So the reason that these are unlike objects is not because the people are different. It's because the prizes are different. If you're selected as first place, you win something different than if you're selected as third place. OK? It wants to know in how many different ways could prizes be awarded. So notationally speaking, and I didn't make a mention of it over here, but this is actually the notation we start with. The number in front is how many we pick from. The number afterwards is how many we choose. So we have 30 contestants. It's a permutation, OK? Because every object is different. That's what makes them different, makes them distinct. And then I'm choosing three of them because there's three prizes. <coughs> so all the prizes are different. And it matters then what order I pick them in. Because if I pick you first or third, you get different amounts of money. Notationally, the notation on top is always the factorial of how many people I'm choosing or how many objects I'm choosing. Here it's third. <coughs> And the denominator is always the subtraction of the two. So 30, in this case, minus 3. You could also think of it as the denominator is how many you don't choose. It's 27 factorial, because I chose 3. So on top, I have that 30 factorial. On the bottom, I do have 27 factorial. So watch what happens. Just like in my starburst example, I want to write the number out until I get to the matching piece on bottom, but there's only one piece on bottom, and it happens pretty quickly here. So I have 30 times 29 times 28 times 27 factorial, which now matches perfectly with my 27 factorial on bottom. And when they match perfectly in factorial notation, then and only then can they cancel. So this actually breaks down into simply multiplying 30 <coughs> times 29 times 28. What is 30 times 29 times 28? 24,360. 24, so there's 24,360 ways of doing this. I want to show you something very interesting. Sometimes a problem has more than one way that can be solved. I know that's like a shocker, right? There's not only one way to solve problems. I hope you know that in general. It's a true statement. Um, this is a really good example of one of those. In fact, the way we just did it is perfectly fine, but we've actually talked even today about another way to do this problem. This problem actually could be done with the fundamental principle of counting as well. And the reason is because there are, in fact, three winners. If I'm thinking about drawing numbers out of a hat, how many people can win the first time? Well, there's 30 of them. But after that person wins, they don't go back in the hat. Now there's 29 people that I'm choosing from. And after that person wins, they don't go back in the hat, there's 28 people I'm choosing from. And if you take a look, that's the same three numbers we just multiplied. But from a different perspective, that is equally right. So there are going to be occasions in your problems in section 94 <laughs> where you have some choices and you get to pick which one it actually fits. And you might pick something different than someone else. You'll get the same answers, but your perspective might look a little bit different based on how you're reading it. So this is when the order does not, I'm sorry, when the order does matter, that the three prizes were different. The last one, last method that is to say, is the combination. When we have a combination, the order doesn't matter. Now you'll notice that the formula looks similar to the other formula. In fact, it's got an n factorial on top and it's got an n minus r factorial on bottom. But it also has 
and R factorial on bottom that we didn't have before. What that means is there's going to be fewer of these, right? This number is going to be smaller because I'm dividing it by additional stuff, right? This piece right here, the n factorial over the n minus r factorial, that's what the last one would have given me. And I'm going to divide it by additional pieces of information. So I'm going to be getting a smaller number. So what does it mean for order not to matter? Well, if we take our last example and adjust it just a little bit, we can see one that does. 30 contestants put their name in a hat for a raffle. Three people win 75 bucks. <coughs> in how many ways can the prizes be awarded? Well, now it doesn't matter if I was drawn first or if I was drawn last. I still win the same thing, right? The order of my picking, if, as long as I'm picked, doesn't matter. So this one would be a combination because the order doesn't matter. I get the same prize whether I'm picked first, second, or third. So this one's a combination of 30 people in this case, 30 names, and I choose three of them. I have that same 30 factorial on top. I have that same 30 minus 3 factorial on bottom, but I also now have a 3 factorial on bottom. So, right, we already said this is 27 factorial from a moment ago. So I'm going to still write my 30 times 29 times 28 times 27 factorial that will cancel perfectly with the 27 factorial on bottom. And I have 3 times 2 times 1. So my 27 factorials cancel. You can do this component-wise. You can do this however. I'll, I'll do it component-wise this time. So you don't have to actually say 3 times 2 is 6 and it cancels with a 30, although it does. You could say, hey, look, the 3 cancels with the 30 and leaves me with 10. And the 2 cancels with the 28 and leaves me 14. Okay, you can cancel them with whichever pieces. It doesn't matter as long as they truly reduce that way. So I have 10 <coughs> times 29 times 14. So what is 10 times 29 times 14? 4,060 different ways. That's a lot less than my last one, right? About one-sixth. The last one was 24,000, and this is 4,000. Now, here's the deal. Because the order doesn't matter, I can't use the fundamental principle of counting on this one. Right? Because how do I decide? I mean, I can put my first person in there as they're 30, but then they don't go back in the hat, but the second person who wins wins the same thing as the first person. There's no way to distinguishably fix this like I did on the last one. So there isn't another way to do this particular problem. This is it. So when the order of things doesn't matter, it's a combination all out. Like there's nothing else that can be done. We'll do one more example. It'll finish up this page nicely, and then we'll move on to the next pages next time. So as we look at the rest of the problems, I've given you an example, at least, of every single type. Fundamental principle of counting, uh, permutation of like objects, that's the starburst, permutation of unlike objects, and combination. And they all have a little bit of different uniqueness to them, and sometimes they overlap in certain situations. On number six, it says we have a phone numbers in a business. The phone numbers start 405767, and then there's four other digits afterwards. So back in the day when dorm rooms had, um, like, phones, like, you know, not everybody had cell phones. I know it's like a foreign concept, but that's how it was when I was in a dorm room. This is what would have happened. They all have the same first, you know, the area code and the first three digits, and then everything else on campus changes now after that. Dorm rooms, office phone numbers, all the offices on campus. Even now it would be like this. We just don't have as many landlines because we don't have the dorm rooms. But we would want to know how many phone numbers are possible if we do this. Do we have enough? in this business or in that school or whatever to utilize this particular strategy and keep those first six numbers the same. So how could I figure out how many different phone numbers are possible by just changing those last four digits? Any thoughts? <coughs> Got four options. We have fundamental principle of counting, permutation of like objects, permutation of unlike objects and combinations. Okay, so let's talk about one at a time. Combination. Combination means the order doesn't matter. Does the order of the last four digits matter? It better, because when somebody dials your phone number, it goes to you and not, you know, somebody else in your household who happens to have all the same digits the same, but 
you swap to the last two, right? So order matters, so it's not a combination. We've ruled one out. So a permutation. A permutation has the feeling, though, where I need them all to be distinctly different, right? So like, remember my, per my persons who has pulled the numbers from the hat? The first person that was selected out and the second person have to be different persons. Do my numbers have to be different numbers? No. So it's not a permutation of, like, of unlike objects because the numbers don't have to be unlike, right? They can be the same. We're down to two. Fundamental theorem of counting is, in fact, the one that works. There are four numbers. How many different digits could be in the first blank spot? Ten, zero through nine, so ten different digits. And if I weren't allowed to repeat, which would also be a permutation possibility, then I would do that next. But I can with a phone number. It, it works, right? There are ten different digits for the second one, ten for the third, and ten for the fourth. So I can multiply those tens all together. What value will I get? 10,000. There are 10,000 different numbers. Good grief, that's a B. It's a terrible B, I can't do it. Numbers that would have this first six digits the same, 10,000 different numbers. Any questions on that? All right, so we'll have some more examples of just you know, thinking through how we decide on different values um, or which strategies next time.